This is episode 100 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest. Wait, wait a minute. I I'm the guest. Alyssa Holbrook is actually the host today. Alyssa, take it away. Why am I doing this? <laughs> I'm so excited to be the host and interview you for your 100th episode. So let's start it off with your thoughts about mindset. When people think of mindset, I see certain things that they think of. But when you think of mindset, I think it's slightly different than the average person. Tell me about your unique take on mindset. I think everybody knows why I brought you to host this show then. <laughs> um, well, I actually, when I think about mindset, the way that uh, other people look at it, I think of like kind of hustle and grind culture. You know, that's so popular now that everybody thinks they have to do more, you know, work harder, work more hours, where the way that I look at it is the whole reason I want to perfect my mindset as it relates to real estate investing so I can work less hours. You know, all the people who say I want to get into real estate investing so I can have financial freedom and then they, you know, start trying to flip three houses at the same time, like then they realize they're working, you know, 100 hours a week on the side. So I think the idea of mindset isn't really collectively involved in real estate investing. And that's, you know, that's kind of why I started the podcast. I hope I could change that. And then when we met, we're like, Ooh, we like the same things. Like, let's just talk about mindset. But don't you think, I mean, you know, now we've been talking about it so much. What's your view on the same thing there? Where are people getting hung up on mindset? Do you think? Yeah. The main thing that I see is like kind of that toxic positivity. Like I'm just going to almost like gaslight myself. Like I have this perspective, I have this view, and instead I'm not going to believe that that's important or valid. And so when I think mindset, I think like going inward with your emotions and actually believing yourself. Oh, that's so interesting that you see it that way, like everyone working together. And I really feel like you live that with how you emphasize networking. So tell me a little bit more about the value of understanding people and building relationships within real estate. I, I truly don't know anyone who does that more than you. Like that what is... But that's no, crazy, no, though, amazing. because, you know, like, I don't even like to leave the house. Yeah. You know? and, and we found that out because we you were you helped me get through BP con because I don't like crowds and I don't like spaces. And we were able to go to a lot of the stuff together. But I think the reason why I'm good at networking and building that into as a business is because I actually care. And I've never yeah. had a desperation principle, which, which helps. I've been fortunate, so I didn't have to you know, say like, well, I need to get the money from this deal. Like if I don't get the mm -hmm. money from a deal in a timely fashion, I'm going to be okay. So that gives me, makes it a little bit easier for me. But I think if more people were focused on doing things the right way, more money would come and then more money would come after that. And it's a short-term thinking that is really killing real estate. And I think because I never wanted to get something from networking, like sure, as an agent, I'd like to get some deals, but I'll never ask anyone for that. You know, I remember when I first got licensed, somebody said, oh, put in your signature, you know, hey, I'm here for all referrals. If you're looking to buy, sell or invest. And I'm like, I mean, that sounds stupid. Why? Like that's to, then they know it's not just to them. And I'm and I'm begging and I don't I don't want to beg for business. I want to earn business by, you know, doing it the right way. And I think that's been my way in on market real estate and in investing. When I hold a meetup or when I have a podcast, I don't have a gain, you know, from the show. I've, now, you know, interviewed 99, including you, 99 real estate investors. Well, their first six weren't people. Um, sure. So 93. But every episode I get off and I've learned something new. And then that's another partnership. We became friends because I had you on my podcast. I didn't totally. know you before that. I think we connected on Instagram. And then so and, and I've also learned that through these years and through all my friends at Bigger Pockets and then having everybody on and them saying, oh, I found Bigger Pockets. You know, and then I went to Bigger Pockets conference, and then it's like you see that the the network is open. It doesn't always have to be perfect, but it's how you use the network, and the more mindfully you use the network, definitely the more benefits you're going to get out of it. How are Hello? you feeling when they when they ask you that? Like, how are you feeling? What is that like? Like aggrieved, like annoyed, and <laughs> uh, put on because I think. You know, every you, a lot of people know I don't talk on the phone at all. And it's for this exact reason. One, my phone rings 150 times a day. So I just mm -hmm. silence every call. Um, but time is really important to me. And I don't think that you yeah. can be mindful in anything that you do if you're always rushing around. That yeah. completely makes you 
it it crushes the ability to be mindful because you don't have a choice the chance to reflect at all mm. and this is what people are doing it's basically modern real estate marketing is just spam you know text messaging random sellers you know hey do you want to sell your house i hope somebody bites well what if you spent an hour figuring out who that person was looked up the data did some deep dives looked around social tried to get enough information then go out and see if you could help them you know, isn't this going to be a better strategy? And I think a lot of the house flippers that I think are the best and even the best wholesalers, they're really there to help people. They want to make money too. And you can help people and make money. And that's, a, that's a win-win, but you, you know, you can't be scratching for an extra thousand, but like you were saying before, I mean, some people, they need, they need the money, but this isn't the right industry for that. You know, if yeah. you need that $1,000 wholesale fee, this isn't it because you're, you're yeah. going to be putting your needs over the other people in the transaction. And those people are losing a home or selling a home or don't know where they're going. And I think that's where, you know, when I think of why I brought mindfulness to real estate investing, it's really about, about that. It's not, it's not just a house, it's someone's house and there's land under it. You know, yeah, there's yeah, a whole yeah. system where there was nothing there before where you have land and a house. It's cool. You can buy both, yeah. but what's your use going to be and who are you putting out, you know, from that house? And I did have to learn that at an early age because my dad was a really nice landlord, but we did have to do some uncomfortable foreclosure removals where at the time you just called the sheriff and they literally came and put all the stuff out on the lawn and, and then you just padlocked the door. How did you not just turn away from real estate? What's the value in it? Oh, my dad was just such a good teacher without, without, mm -hmm. I mean, he was in my mind at the time as like a 14, you know, 15 year old, he was annoying. But he really wasn't annoying. He was cool. You know, just like I hope my yeah. kids actually think I'm cool. But he was always trying to teach me something. So my dad was such a nice person that that was always a last, you know, option. But at some point, it's like, you know, you let them stay for two years in a foreclosure. Like, we're not getting paid. Like, we have to turn the property. We have to do something. So there are times when we had to do it. And he would always turn it into a lesson. I always tell this story because it's actually like no one believes it's actually true. But it is. We had to it was a two year foreclosure window, everything that we waited, nothing, they hadn't have any money. A lot of people were trying to help them. We were like, we're willing to help. Somebody has to pay us though. We own the house, you know, we, right. uh, we have it. Uh, so eventually we had to, we had to put them out. We tried for years to figure out where they were going to go. Somebody finally had told us they, you know, they were, they really did have a place to go. They just didn't want to leave. Mm -hmm. So when the sheriffs came and they, they were putting their stuff out on the lawn, these people, they were older, they were like 80 years old. This is again, two years of, of no payments or anything. Um, and, and they laid down in front of my car and I was 16 and I'm driving and my dad's in the passenger seat, which he didn't like driving with me anyway. And I'm like, well, I, you know, I'm like freaking out and everybody's yelling. The neighbors are coming over. There's dogs running around. And I'm like, what, what do you want me to do? Like, this is insane. Like, this is what this is. And he, my dad was so calm. He's just like, well, just drive around him. I'm like that. The, the driveway's not there. He's like, just drive on the grass. I'm like, I don't want to mess up my car. He's like, J there's no rocks. Just drive on the grass around him. I'm like, I'm going to run into him. He's like, he's laying on the ground. He's not going to move. Just I, So I drove around him and I just drove out onto the street off, not off the driveway. You know, and I'm like really stressed out, like 16 year old, like sweating bullets, you know, <laughs> and we're just driving down the road. And then my dad's, you know, probably was just like, well, let's go to friendlies and get ice cream. I'm like, okay. You know, like he, he didn't make anything a big deal. And that was kind of, you know, what he did for me in life in general, which was he was providing a mindful basis for me well before I even knew that that was in existence. Because whenever I had a problem, I would just call him and just like, you know, basically be annoyed on the phone. And five minutes later, I'd feel better. And I think in knowing that and the way that he taught that it was like, He's going to keep talking to me about investing every time. You know, he was waiting for me after school uh, on Fridays every day in front of my school in Brooklyn. He was always waiting, he was never late on time every single Friday to pick me up for the weekend. And then the whole way we're going to talk about real estate wow. and money. I love that. Money and real estate.